Hello, I am Philip Pearl from the Department of Neurology at Austin Children's Hospital and the current president of the Child Neurology Society. I would like to thank Bernard Don and the editorial staff of Developmental Medicine and Child Neurology for inviting this editorial on Child Neurology, COVID-19 and Crisis in Society, which is appearing in the August 2020 issue of the journal. The, this has hardly been an auspicious start to a decade uh, with the corona virus that really began in December of 19 and has caused this terrible disease. Our response here in the US really felt like it started in about March with first social distancing, facial covering, vigilant hand hygiene. And for those who remember, conferences were suddenly being canceled. We downsized our meetings from 100 people in the room to 10 to over the course of two weeks, no face-to-face -face meetings. We converted our services that we could to telehealth. Now here we are six months later with worldwide over 20 million cases and approximately 750,000 deaths. This raised for the Child Neurology Society, as well as all of medicine, some fundamental ethical issues that we ended up calling practical bioethics, including the allocation of potentially limited resources, ranging from ventilators to hospital beds, and our obligations to prevent disease and provide healthcare, and also balance this with protecting our own healthcare personnel. We had to exercise the cardinal ethical principle of non-maleficence, but by utilizing telemedicine and not squandering resources, by not providing non-essential or disproportionate care, and not promoting misinformation or ineffective therapies. In pediatric neurology, we set about with identifying vulnerable populations. One such group of which is in our particular care is that of children presenting with infantile spasms. We felt that an urgent change in standard of care was needed. So for example, changing from inpatient video EEG hospitalizations to home videos, limiting use of EEG for diagnosis and going to outpatient studies only, and changing our first course therapy, first line therapy from typically intramuscular ACTH for many providers to oral prednisolone, except for the children with tuberous sclerosis who would start with the gabatrin. Our recommendations were divided into those that are enduring, meaning to outlast even the pandemic versus to limit meaning limited to the time of the pandemic, but with possible applicability to future crises in healthcare delivery. These were published in the Annals of Neurology and the Journal of Child Neurology. At the same time, we had the, a crisis in America that's ongoing, but was crystallized with police brutality sharpening our focus on institutionalized racism in late May when Minneapolis police fatally strangulated a Mr. George Floyd, superimposed upon recent and not so recent police murders of other innocent or defenseless victims. And this led to massive protests that persist throughout the US and the world. In the case of the Child Neurologists and the Child Neurology Society, our comments and my reflections on this are these. We have dedicated our lives to the care of children we hold them dear and show our love and compassion no matter their race or background. We care for their families and offer help whenever we are called upon to do so. And our obligations carry a heavy load. This was published by the Child Neurology Society Executive Committee in an editorial in the Annals of Neurology, the official journal of the Child Neurology Society. I believe the response of medical professionals of ourselves as professionals and citizens includes that a strong statement be made that racism be defeated but yet we prove this every day in clinic and in our interactions with each other. We need to join with others to mobilize as a society to end racism, intolerance, oppression. These themes are as old as civilization itself. Racism shows up in healthcare in several ways. One is healthcare disparities with worse outcomes in minority populations, including the number of COVID-19 cases and deaths, as well as other disorders, low birth rate, even less likelihood to survive childhood cancer. Also, there's this issue of emotional trauma, just watching something vicariously, like someone being brutalized, or microaggressions where a person may make a comment having no idea that this comment is, can be very personalized and insulting and hurtful to someone, and that can happen frequently and subtly and, and wear someone down. And how should a child respond when hearing one of these comments? The, one's first response might be, did it even happen? It's a difficult situation. The building blocks of anti-racist healthcare involve ideas like these that were brought to me by two psychologists in our own department of psychiatry here at Boston Children's Hospital to speak up when witnessing microaggressions or discrimination, to exercise strong leadership and individual action, and be open to learning, making mistakes, and doing better. In conclusion, 
our response to the pandemic uh, has been to address practical bioethics that are really important for our own practices, new standards of care for vulnerable populations, including patients with infantile spasms, developing a telemedicine toolkit, and a guide for a safe return to in-person practice. Solutions to racism include that we model the solutions every day. We must confront our own biases, but Chell Neurology can lead the way. Thank you for joining me. I hope you enjoy the issue of the journal.